Part 1 Part 1 First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hello, I am a new student here. Hello, what can I do for you? Can you tell me what the student union does? Well, we're part of the National Union of Students, who represent students' interests across the country. We provide services for all students at this college. What kind of services? There are advisors and welfare staff, entertainments, sports clubs, union societies, meetings, campaigns, and special interest groups. We offer everything from ballroom dancing to karate, jazz, and political debates. Sounds great. How can you help overseas students? As I've said, we have welfare officers who are used to the sort of problems overseas students may have. They know where to get advice on a particular situation, or basically give whatever help is asked for. I am from the Philippines, and I hope I can meet other Filipino students who are here. I play chess and many sports, especially badminton, basketball and wrestling. Please, can you tell me how to find out about these things? There is a Filipino society at the college. Regular meetings take place and lots of social activities are organised, such as meals, plays and dances. The society is made up of Filipino students and other students who have an interest in the Philippines. And what about the sports? Does the union offer the ones I'm interested in? Yes, we do. There are basketball and wrestling teams. If you want to play in one of the college teams, you have to go along to training sessions and compete for a place. For badminton, you can either go to the badminton club or book a court to play with friends. Is there also a chess club or team? No, I'm afraid not. It may be best for you to put a notice on our notice board to find other players. Will that cost me anything? No, it's a free service available to all students, but you have to give your notice to a union officer first, so that it's fair for everyone who wants to use the notice board. I only have a room for one month at the moment. I need to find a house or a flat to live in near the college. Are you able to help me with any accommodation problems? There are always rooms available in shared flats or houses on our notice board. The college has some of its own accommodation, and you can also apply for these. If you have any problems at all, you should talk to one of the student union's welfare officers, who can give specialist advice on accommodation. Thank you for your help. You're welcome. Now would you mind helping us? We're conducting a survey to learn more about the students who visit our union office, so that we can improve our services. Would you mind if I asked you a few questions? Not at all. Now look at questions 5 to 10. As you listen to the student's conversation with the union officer, fill in the spaces 5 to 10 on the form. First, you have some time to look at the form. Now listen carefully and fill in gaps 5 to 10. Now would you mind helping us? We're conducting a survey to learn more about the students who visit our union office, so that we can improve our services. Would you mind if I asked you a few questions? Not at all. First of all, what is your name? My name is Cesar Bautisto. How do you spell your last name? 
B A U T I S T O. Thank you. And what are you studying? Development economics. I see. And how long is the course for? One year. It's a postgraduate diploma. What would you like to do at the end of it? Have you made your mind up yet? Yes, I'd like to be a United Nations project advisor. Oh, would you? That sounds interesting. Tell me though, why have you chosen this university? It's got a good reputation in the field of economics. And you say you come from the Philippines? Yes, that's right. And which city do you come from? Manila. Oh, that's the city I've always wanted to go to. What do you do in your spare time? I go to play games. I love sports. Ah, yes, you mentioned that. Basketball, badminton, and wrestling, wasn't it? Yes, that's right. Okay, that's it. I'll add your name to our mailing list. We appreciate your help with this survey. If you have any suggestions, be sure to give us a call or drop by at any time. All right, I will. Thank you. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. Everyone knows that we have achieved a huge amount in terms of space exploration. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Everyone knows that we have achieved a huge amount in terms of space exploration. The space race between ourselves and Russia went on for nearly 20 years, but we were the first to land a man on the moon. At that time, the space race was very close, and the Russians very nearly got to the moon before us. For me, the most exciting invention and the invention that really showed we were ahead in the space race was the reusable space shuttle. It was first successful in 1981 and has since been used on many missions. The reusable shuttle can carry astronauts on space missions and can serve as a laboratory in which to conduct experiments. It can be used to transport equipment to space stations or to collect or repair satellites. The shuttle carries between five and seven crew members. When a mission is complete, the shuttle fires thrusters, which propel it back into the Earth's atmosphere. It then glides down to make its landing. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Although the remains of very early ovens have been found in many parts of the world, it was here that they were first used frequently in people's homes. In ancient Greece and in other parts of Europe and Turkey, people used ovens to bake bread. But it seems there was only one large oven that everyone shared. Here the remains of villages from 5,000 years ago show that each mud-brick house was constructed with an oven and that baking bread and perhaps cooking meat was very common. The ovens were made of clay and shaped like a beehive. Inside they had shelves so that a number of loaves could be cooked together and an opening at the bottom from which ash could be removed. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three.
Part 3. You are going to hear a conversation between a student and a tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen to the tape. And answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Brad. I was wondering if you have time to answer some of my questions about my upcoming test. Sure, no problem, Jeff. What is it that you're having problems on? Well, it's for my English final. We have to prepare a five minute speech to present in front of the whole class, including the professor, so I'm a little bit worried. Is there any specific topic, or can you do it on whatever you want? It has to have something to do with the origins of English literature. I'm thinking of doing it on Shakespeare, but I bet many other students will have the same idea. That's fine. Don't worry if others are doing the same thing. As long as you do a good job, that's all that counts. A good professor will grade all students fairly. You really think so? I suppose Shakespeare is the most famous author, so it should be fine. Besides, Shakespeare has so many works. You only have to choose a couple of them and talk about those. I guess you're right. Do you have any advice about how to prepare a speech? First, you need to select your topic. Have you done this yet? Yes, I have lots of information on Shakespeare. Good. Next, you should do a research on a specific topic. Do you have a deadline for which to turn in your speech topic? The deadline is next Tuesday. So you should have a detailed outline of what you will say by then. Do not just turn in a piece of paper saying Shakespeare on it. That will not give your professor any idea as to what you will be talking about. OK. a y So you think I should write out an outline of my speech? Of course! Writing your speech out in outline form is essential. No one could give a speech from scratch. Even the president must refer to his outline when giving a speech. An outline will give you a good structure to base your speech on. Now look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen to the tape and answer questions 26 to 30. That's true. I was thinking that I would do an outline last, after I figured everything out. But I think your idea is better. What should I do after I have an outline prepared? You should then write the speech out, word for word, what you're going to say. This is so you'll have a firm idea of what you will say. It doesn't mean that the speech you will give will be exactly the same, but at least you have a fairly good idea what the final product will be. At this point, I can read it over for you if you want. Really? That would be great. I would appreciate that so much. No problem. Once you write it out, the next step is to practice giving the speech. At first, you can do it in front of the mirror, so you can see your expressions and your presentation. After that, you should practice giving your speech to some friends. I can listen to it for you too. That's a great idea. I really owe you a big f a v o r then. Sure, you can do my Latin homework for me. Just kidding. Seriously, don't worry about it. I can help you with anything you need. So, when is the speech due? Well, the speech topic is due next Tuesday. The speech itself will be due next Friday. I can help you any time you want because I have no tests this next week. Besides, I'm an English major and Shakespeare is one of my favourite authors, so helping you out will be no big deal. Thanks so much. Well, I'm going to the library to get started on all this. I'll call you tomorrow. See you tomorrow then. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute. 
to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a historian giving a presentation about techniques to identify the origin of handwritten books from the Middle Ages. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. My presentation today is on how the science of genetics is being used to shed light on the origin of manuscripts, anything written by hand, produced in the medieval period, that is, the period between the 5th and 15th centuries AD. As many of you know, thousands of medieval handwritten books still exist today. Some of them have a clear provenance, that is, we know exactly where and when they were written but the origin of many manuscripts has been a complete mystery. That is, until 2009, when geneticists started using DNA testing to shed light on their origins. But before looking at the new research, I need to explain something about the way the manuscripts were produced, particularly what they were written on. Virtually all were written on treated animal skins, and there were essentially two types. The first was parchment, which is made of sheepskin. It has the quality of being very white, but also being thin. It has a naturally greasy surface, which meant it was hard to erase writing from it. This made it much sought after for court documents in medieval times. The second type is vellum, which is calfskin. This was most often used for any very high-status documents because it provided the best writing surface, so scribes could achieve lettering of high quality. So, once the animal hides had been chosen, they had to be prepared. Where the right materials were on hand, the skins were put into large barrels or vats of lime, where they were agitated or stirred frequently. But if lime wasn't available, then the hides were buried. Both these techniques were designed to cause the hair to slough off and the skins to become gelatinous and therefore more flexible. The next stage was to put the hides on stretcher frames and pull them very tight. While on the frame, they were scraped with a moon-shaped knife in order to create a uniform thickness. For parchment, that was the end of the process. But for vellum, there was an additional stage where it was bleached in order to achieve the desired color. So, what does all this preparation mean for the quest to identify the origins of mystery manuscripts? Well, until recently, the only way historians and other academics were able to guess at origins was either through the analysis of the handwriting style or from the dialect in which the piece was written. But these techniques have proven unreliable for a number of reasons. It was thus decided to try to look at the problem from a different angle, to start from what is known, that is, the small number of manuscripts whose origins we do already know. Because these parchments and vellum are both made from animal hides, it was possible to subject them to DNA testing and to identify the genetic markers for the date and location of production. From this was created what is known as a baseline. The next stage was to test the mystery manuscripts, finding their DNA characteristics, and then making comparisons between the known and the mystery scripts. Genetic similarities and differences enabled the scientists to gain more information about the origins of the many manuscripts we had known virtually nothing about up to that point. Now you might ask, what are the potential uses of this new information? Well, obviously, it can shed light on the origin of individual books and manuscripts. But that's not all. It can also shed light on the evolution of the whole of the manuscript production industry in medieval times. And because that was such a thriving business, involving very large-scale movements right across the globe, the new data in turn help historians establish which trade routes were in operation during the whole millennium.
Now, if anyone has any questions... That is the end of part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.